Joining us now for World Brief and the review of some of the headlines of today's newspaper around the world is Adefemi Akisoya. Adefemi, great to have you in London. In it. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Rafai. Good morning, Ayo. Good morning to you all. Good morning, Ali Femi. So good to hear your voices. I always say it's the highlight of my morning, oh. being able to see you, even if I can't see you, being able to hear you. It just, it just puts me in a wonderful mood. Yeah. I, I, I just have to say. Yeah, Amen. You're, 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 well. you're, right. you're the highlight of our morning too. All right. You're the highlight of our morning too. In it. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Let me tell you what's happening around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a date for the debate. Kamala Harris and Donald Trump have both agreed to September 10th being the day they both face off in the next level presidential debate uh, between the two leading parties in the United States. It's a debate that will be hosted by ABC News. Now, you'll remember that this date in, in question, September 10th, and it being hosted by uh, ABC News was something that was always supposed to, be, supposed to happen, especially when Joe Biden was still in the driving seat for re-election. Uh, but when uh, the first uh, debate took place, and clearly that set off sort of the beginning of the end of President Joe Biden's re-election bid, uh, there was some back and forth about whether or not uh, Donald Trump was going to agree to debate Kamala Harris, especially since in such a short time, just two weeks, she's been able to completely breathe a new sense of life into the Democratic Party. Uh, after the, ass the assassination attempt on former President Trump, it did seem as though he was able to, he was able to galvanize a huge section of the American electorate and perhaps ride the wave right back into the to the White House. But what we've seen with the coming and the almost immediate endorsement from political heavy hitters in the Democratic Party endorsing Kamala Harris, the money that she's been able to raise again in such a short time definitely has made her a formidable rival. And perhaps that's why there was some uh, a little bit of reluctance from the Trump advance campaign in terms of committing to a date, committing to ABC being the host for this debate. But we have seen now that this debate is going to go ahead and it's going to be a very interesting one because I do think that the Republicans now are going to have to change their tactics when they thought that they would be going up against Joe Biden, perhaps uh, the, their line of attack would have been very similar to what had happened the first time round. But now they're going to have to change their offensive tactic when it comes to debating someone like Kamala Harris. They can now no longer attack her age. They can't attack her competence. They can't attack who she is as a person. Well, I guess they can do that, but they cannot attack it in the same way. They can't sow the same seeds of doubt that they were able to do successfully with Joe Biden. So I do think uh, respectfully that Donald Trump was running away from the prospect of coming up against a, a formidable rival in Kamala Harris, but he has now agreed to do so. Uh, you know, it, reports have just suggested that he had always agreed uh, to uh, debate Kamala Harris, but, you know, we have heard his comments even when he spoke at the NABJ uh, convention in Chicago. He, you know, mizzled around a bit. He didn't really want to com commit to uh, a specific date. He said, you know, maybe I'll debate Kamala, but he has, of course, agreed to do it now, and it will be very interesting interesting now to see what this debate will look like. I do think it's going to be quite juicy and I know that you'll all be looking forward to September 10th for this next uh, debate. I will come to you both for comments but let's move on now to another story. We haven't heard a bit from Venezuela over the coming days and that's not for lack of uh, news content. We do know that there have been ongoing anti-government protests happening in Venezuela because many people in the country do not believe that the incumbent uh, president, Nicolas Maduro, is the rightful winner of this election. But he believes that he is. And he has, in his own words, in his own belief, secured a third six-year term. And that has set off a whole lot of geopolitical tensions inside and outside of the country. But what we're talking about today is Nicolas Maduro flexing his muscles against X. What he has done is temporarily ban X from being accessed in Venezuela for the next 10 days. This is the latest in escalating tensions between Nicolas Maduro and Elon Musk. Elon Musk is, of course, we know, 
the head of X, but it seems as though he's been marketing himself as a bit of a geopolitical analyst. He's had a lot to say about a lot of issues happening around the world here in the United Kingdom, also uh, in the United States, and then of course in South, <laughs> South America, in Venezuela. He has called Nicolas Maduro a dictator and a clown. He says that he is not the rightful winner of the election, and Nicolas Maduro has not taken those ins insults lightly at all. He's accused uh, Elon Musk of uh, inciting violence, inciting fascism and looking to start a civil war so very very harsh words coming between both of those men over in Venezuela and lastly still talking about tensions let's move over to move over to the Middle East where we see the likes of the United States Egypt and Qatar imploring both Israel and Hamas to come to the talking table and discuss what is happening in Gaza. We know that this Arab-Israeli conflict, this issue in the Middle East, this issue in Palestine has been going on for decades. But this latest lease, ever since the October 7th attacks, has escalated further these tensions between both of these sides. What we are seeing now is a relentless bombardment of civilian in Gaza by the Israeli Defense Forces, by the Israeli government, and they have been relentless. They say that they will continue their bombardment until they are able to secure all of the Israeli hostages who remain in Gaza. Likewise, Hamas is still not taking this lightly. They are still fighting for the sovereignty of the Palestinian people, of Palestinian land, and they are also extremely angry that their own leader, Ismail Haniyeh, was killed in, is in Iran just last week. Now, Israel have not taken responsibility for that attack but Hamas do believe and do find Israel responsible for that and they are talking about retaliation so this is why you have different allies coming to the table and imploring both sides to sit down and discuss now Israel has sent off has has somewhat agreed to some form of conversation that Israel has said that it will send negotiators uh, to discuss with Hamas around uh, August 15th. Hamas, as it stands now, have not uh, responded immediately, haven't said whether or not they're going to send negotiators. As I said, they're still quite angry about what has happened to their leader being assassinated in Iran. But these are the issues that we're seeing across the world. All right, real quickly, finally, I'm so excited about the debate. Like Kamala Harris says, if you want to say anything, please say to my face. And finally, it's going to happen. What are going to be the strong points on the debate? All Trump is going to talk about is race and is going to, uh, you know, try as much as possible to be able to downplay the need for a very caring government, which the Republicans will call a socialist government. He will talk about his tax cuts for the rich because that's what it's all about. The Republicans always make the rich rich at the expense of the poor. And that's never trickled down economics. Also, the Democrats will talk about how they're going to push tax cuts for, you know, the middle uh, wage earners. That's the middle class of the society. They care more about the people. They're going to talk about abortion and female rights, you know, reproductive rights and things like that. And um, she's going to have another big advocate in the governor of, High, uh, the governor of Minnesota, which is a running mate, Waltz. So it's going to be a very, very good debate. And I hope she's going to be able to grill him and remind him of the fact that he's a convicted felon in the first place. Let's not forget that because we've forgotten many things around this race in the first place. But we can't wait for it to come. I know Trump is going to come and have big league, like he says. Uh, as regards Maduro, the truth is, I do not support shutting down any media. And it has to be said, it's dictatorial in nature. Mm. But also Elon Musk should remember that he didn't buy Twitter to cause a third world war. Apparently, it is Elon Musk that is causing chaos most of the world now. He's become an international pariah, just like he was supporting the right wing in the UK with violence, talking about the fact that there's a civil war that's going to happen. Who is he? Right. Is he Oliver Cromwell? The last time that happened was after uh, the king was, was pushed out and Oliver Cromwell became the Lord Protectorate of England. So he must stop it and people must be able to rein him in, in this level of rich madness that he's having. All right. Well, uh, absolutely correct. I was going to say that I, I think it's about time. I'm sure that X has a board of directors who have interest in the company and it's time to rein him in if they can rein him in. Perhaps was this the reason why he bought X? Um, I can't even imagine Jack Dorsey getting involved, especially in very sensitive matters. He's encroaching, he is interfering and he, I don't know how he's I, I think I'd asked the question already as to who's going to stop 
Elon Musk. I, I don't know which is a big, bigger threat, he or the people that he's accusing of being dictatorial. But I, I, like you've mentioned, absolutely uh, condemn the banning of any media, but Elon Musk also has to be stopped. He has to be cautioned. I don't know how that's going to play out. But let me come back to yesterday's press conference um, held by Donald Trump. There have been mixed um, responses to that, even behind the rationale or the reason why he stepped forward. And the fact that this might be an indication that he is indeed jittery about facing a formidable opponent. Adifemi had said that you know he cannot argue against her competence. He actually said she was barely competent. He actually challenged Kamala Harris's um, competence and he ensured that he kept on saying Kamala Kamala and I thought it was very deliberate for him to have done that even though she had emphasized that her name is Kamala and then beyond that um, he also said that the reason why she's getting the popularity is because, because of the honeymoon period just to say that he that press conference was also very determinant about um, really downplaying her as a candidate right. and her competence and her ability to lead the United States of America. But as she said, talk to my face. So hopefully by September 10, she'll do that. Um, but yeah, I, I think those are the things to look forward to in the next few days. Um, I was going to talk about Israel and Yahya Sinwa, but uh, All right. over uh, to you. Very quickly, of course, everybody is talking about the United States, Harris versus Trump. Now, you know, when you look at Donald Trump, uh, uh, when oh you look at his God. outing yesterday, hey, hey, <laughs> defend me. <laughs> I was... When you look at Donald Trump's uh, uh, outing yesterday, it was classic Donald Trump. It was Donald Trump in his element. Now, that's a gift and a curse because Donald Trump in his element is what got him into office to begin with. It was this style, this controversial style that he has where he just speaks off the cuff and he's uh, relatable to a really significant audience. Uh, you know, and some people, I believe one of his advisors is calling what's currently happening a suspended reality because they're saying that, you know, let, let the Harris campaign have this moment, but um, it's just a moment. It's a honeymoon period. We're going to come right back in. So it will be quite intriguing to see what will transpire when the debate happens, because I have watched a number of videos of Kamala Harris addressing economic issues, uh, and I was not really excited by it. So it'll be interesting to see a Trump uh, who needs to be fact-checked and a Kamala Harris who may not have the depth that uh, we'll be looking forward to. But uh, let's see. Anyway, let's move on to news headlines uh, across the globe. And of course, we begin here in Nigeria uh, with this day newspaper, right, Adefemi? Uh, all right, uh, Adefemi, I bet, uh, we're getting into the newspaper review Thanks now, so right? Much. Yeah. Thank, yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Vimbai. So yes, as you said, let's start with this day newspaper. And this day, if we look at the front cover of this day, it's looking at uh, the comments made by the Minister of Information and National Orientation, Mohamed Idris, who is arguing that the removal of subsidies and this Forex window reunification are both aimed at rescuing Nigeria's economy. Now, he made this argument during a courtesy visit uh, to the Arise Global Media offices in Lagos. Now, the chairman of the Arise Media Group, Prince Unduka Obaigwena, led the the discussion with many members of the Arise News family in attendance and it was a great way uh, to listen again to have an example of the federal government talking to the people via journalists via the media and it was great to hear him speak so candidly and ha have the opportunity for questions to be posed to him listen to what uh, people who have their ears close to the ground definitely journalists have to say about what is happening in the land and try and forge some sort of uh, of social contract between the federal government and the people of Nigeria, especially at a time where this cost of living crisis is definitely deteriorating a lot of social trust between the people and their government there. Staying on the topic of the Nigerian economy, now if we move on to the front page of the New Telegraph, and again, the Nigerian economy is being discussed. Bode George, who as we know is the former deputy national chairman of the People's Democratic Party that the opposition force there. He has been urging the federal government, uh, talking to, specifically to President Tinubu as well, he's been urging them to tell Nigerians the truth about the oil sector, to educate them about what is going on, whether or not there is still a fuel subsidy, he says, because there's conflicting and confusing information going on. So he's imploring on the federal government and uh, President Tinubu to talk to Nigerians directly and let them know what is happening within the oil sector of their own country. Let's move on to the front page of the leadership newspaper today and the leadership is talking about 
how in the face of significant economic struggles currently confronting the nation, leaders from Nigeria's north central region have made a compelling appeal to President Tinubu, urging him and his government to suspend all foreign trips for one year. They believe that this action would go some way, again, into building some trust, into saving some money and perhaps cooling the tensions that we're seeing in the regions that they are representing. It'll be interesting or not uh, whether or not uh, the, the government will pay heed to this request, whether or not the president will do so, because again, just weeks ago, we were talking about the presidential fleet, the money's being spent to upgrade it. And so with the North Central leaders, they're, they're calling on the Nigerian president and the Nigerian government entirely to take a step back from foreign trips for one year. Let's move on to the front page of The Punch. And The Punch is looking at the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, the NMPCL and how they have demanded a refund of 4.7 trillion naira from the federal government to settle outstanding debts used to import PMS. Now, properly, uh, this PMS is what we call petrol, of course, isn't it? Now, their claim is that uh, this their claim is listed as an exchange rate differential on PMS and other joint venture taxes. Now, if we just break that down, when we're talking about exchange rate differentials, what they're referring to is the income accrued or uh, the, the income accrued to banks or government agencies from the difference in values uh, between two currencies at different times through foreign exchanges, sale and purchase prices. A lot of jargon there, a lot of macroeconomic jargon there. I'm sure, again, the Global Business Report will break it down for us all. They'll have the time to do so. But let me move on to the Guardian newspaper. The Guardian newspaper is looking at the so-called white elephant projects. Uh, billions down the drain, they report, as the Southeast struggles with abandoned mega projects such as the 10-story World Trade Center in Ibonyi State, which never did make it off the ground. And then also listed example of former Imo State Governor Roches Okorocha, who awarded contracts for 27 general hospitals to be built across the 27, 27 local council areas. And to this state, they have not uh, reached operational status. So those are the newspapers in Nigeria that we're looking at. Very quickly, I'll just take uh, one or two papers from the African continent. The Daily Graphic of Ghana is looking at gold refinery and how the first refinery where the government holds a stake has been commissioned in Ghana. It will have the capacity to refine 400 kilograms of raw 24 karat gold every day. And also this refinery is called the Royal Ghana Gold Refinery can process the entire volume of Ghana's gold exports within 300 working days. Now this refinery is a public private partnership in condition in addition to in relation with the Ghanaian government and the Bank of Ghana. So it's a wonderful example in theory at least of the government and private entities working together for the betterment of their country, especially when they're looking at their own natural resources. And then lastly, being as we are still in the United Kingdom, before I throw back to you in the studio day in Lagos, I did want to mention a, an article on the front page of The Times. The Times in the United Kingdom are looking at how a visa curb has sparked a massive drop a decline in new migrants coming into the country. In fact, they say that requests to work and study in the United Kingdom have fallen by a third. Back to you in the studio. I mean, uh, okay. All right, well, we're out of time. So sorry. Thank you so much, Adifemi, for bringing us um, a review of newspapers from around the world.